Well, thank you very much and uh, good morning, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here representing uh, the CWTA, uh, which is the Authority on Wireless Issues, Developments and Trends in Canada. I first want to thank uh, JC and Senjen for putting on today's uh, conference and giving us the opportunity to talk about something which I think um, is very exciting, and that's going to be uh, the next generation uh, of wireless technology, uh, which is 5G. Uh, but I want to just start off by saying that uh, I'm about three years into this job. Um, and before this, I actually had what I considered to be the best job uh, in Canada from a political perspective. I was the Premier of Prince Edward Island, so I got to represent Anne of Green Gables, oysters, mussels, lobster, potatoes, and lots of golf courses. Um, and if I could have thought about the next job that I was going into, uh, probably the last one I would have thought about would have been uh, the CWTA and dealing with wireless issues uh, in Canada. And I say that probably because my kids are 6, 8, and 10, and they ask me uh, what I do, and I tell them, well, you know, I work for the Wireless Association of Canada. Well, what's that, Daddy? And, they, uh, and I tell them, you know, it's about innovation, technology, the next generation of what you're going to be able to do with your phone and, and how the world's going to work with uh, new wireless technology. And they go, how did you get that job, Daddy? You need to ask us how to turn on the television. Um, but uh, it's an extremely uh, exciting uh, field uh, that I got to join. And I'm proud to be the representative of the wireless industry in Canada, because quite frankly, I believe it is the most important industry in Canada. If you think of what you do today, from the moment you wake up to the moment you go, bed, go to bed, it's going to be wireless, it, wireless that you're going to be using. Uh, and whether or not you're an individual, a government, or a business, um, what you do on your phone um, is something that is vitally important and is only going to become more important uh, into the future. So Tejas in a few minutes is going to talk a little bit about 5G and what some of the possibilities are, but I just want to start off by telling you a little bit about where we are today. Um, and a lot of these facts I did not know uh, before starting this job. Um, if you look at Canada today, we have access to some of the best, most advanced wireless networks in the world. Now, most people don't necessarily believe that. But the facts are, Canada has the third fastest LTE networks in the world. In fact, we're twice as fast as the United States. Even when you look at our rural centers around Canada, um, we've got, according to Open Signal, they reported that rural Canadians have faster average 4G connection speeds than 76 other countries in the world. In fact, if rural Canada were its own country, it would rank as 12th fastest in terms of average download speeds in the world. In fact, our LTE networks are also available to 99% of Canadians where they live today. But guess what? There's more work to do. There's more build-outs that we need to do. There's more advancements where we need to get to 5G. And all of this can only come about by facilities-based carriers building these world-class networks so all Canadians can use them. Over the last 20-some years, our facilities-based carriers in Canada have invested over $50 billion to be able to have the networks that we have today. That's facilities-based competition with our incumbents and our new entrants competing with one another to deliver the best possible networks. Now, as we get ready for 5G, where does Canada stand today? Open Signal in that report that I talked about where we are the third fastest in the world, they also call Canada a 4G superpower. And when they say a 4G superpower, they say that because we have resilient and strong networks in Canada, and they believe that that is going to allow us to evolve to the next generation of 5G in a much easier capacity than perhaps some other countries out there that are still on 3G and trying to catch up to Canada. But what can 5G actually deliver for Canadians? We're going to hear Tejas talk in a few minutes about some of the exciting things that can come about. But last year, we actually did a report with Accenture uh, looking at the economics of it. And 5G, according to Accenture, 
can create up to 250,000 new full-time jobs for Canada, add 40 billion to our GDP by 2026, but it will also require a $26 billion build-out. And if you need a $26 billion build-out to happen, you need our facilities-based carriers in Canada to ensure that that build-out can happen. Now, today you're gonna to hear about not only the economics of it, but how 5G will benefit Canadians and cities and rural communities. How it can help improve the environment and help connect Canadians in rural Canada. Accenture has done this new report in partnership with us, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about it today. But I just wanna highlight a couple of issues that Tejas is gonna talk about. He's gonna talk about better transportation and mobility that can lead to lowering our carbon footprint. He's gonna talk about better yields for our farmers while enabling our farmers to be better stewards of the land. Better energy management, which can lead to a better environmental footprint. And he's also gonna talk about how 5G will make it easier to connect that last mile so that rural Canadians and Canadians living in remote areas will be able to have access to the networks that we have so that they'll be able to enjoy the economic prosperity that comes with wireless networks and 5G. So it's my pleasure now to welcome Tejas, who is the Director of Global 5G Offering Lead for Accenture, to tell us more about how 5G is gonna make the Canadian economy that much stronger. Thank you very much. Tejas, good luck. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tejas Rao. Thanks, Rob, for uh, introducing me. Uh, JC, thank you for Sanjan for providing the time. Uh, as Rob mentioned, I spend a lot of my time with facility-based operators, helping them accelerate their 5G services. Um, as part of that activity, uh, we just uh, collaborated with CWTA to write the report on what 5G could mean in Canada uh, in terms of acceleration and economic benefits. You know, as we kind of think through what's so different about 5G compared to the previous generations of, of network technology, and the way I think about it is, you know, 4G and 3G technologies was all about deploying the network to get population coverage. And 5G is really setting the stage, and we talked a lot about it this morning, about innovation and cloud native technologies. It sets up the architecture for being services oriented across three dimensions, right? A lot of the solutions we talk about, whether it's smart cities or IoT-based applications you can do with the current networks. But the dimension that 5G provides is massive IoT communications with massive connectivity for devices on one spectrum. On the other dimension, you have the ability to kind of go uh, with massive traffic, so 100 times more traffic. Go to a gigabit speed or 10 gigabits of speed for 5G. It's literally taking your fiber connection and putting it into your pocket. And the last bit of 5G is really driving the latency down to less than a millisecond, which then starts to drive a lot more of that innovation agenda. So enabling all of that uh, requires, as Rob mentioned in our previous report, the facilities-based carriers to invest $26 billion. And it's going to take six to seven years, typically, to deploy these types of networks. And so you'll start to see a proliferation of applications, starting with IoT, but as you kind of think through the spectrum of what's possible, what could be invented, or what could be net new, that's where a lot of the startup community can get hold of the technology to kind of think about what's the art of the possible, right? And as we move towards getting more broadband, more traffic capacity, and getting to that lower latency, you'll start to see that innovation take fold in new applications. But what does it mean for Canadian communities in terms of what 5G could do for them? And that's on a, on a spectrum of consumers, industries, and government. And so we took the lens across those three participants and said, across the spectrum, and we've got 5G use cases that are across all of those three dimensions, and we selected four that are gonna have the highest impact over the next two to three years. And that's, on transportation, as we thought, as we talked about the commute uh, in the cities, uh, what can we do to improve the commute time and reduce the congestion? 
It's around energy. It's around um, providing rural broadband connectivity and agriculture. So those are the four out of all of the use cases that we selected to kind of do a deep dive on and understand what would be the impact in Canada by enabling some of these solutions. So as we think about transportation and mobility, you think about the 10 major cities in Canada with having a population of over half a million people, and you start to see the commute times increasing in these cities, how could 5G with massive IoT connectivity, with that low latency, start to drive analytics and solutions in smart cities, or in transportation, creating corridors with autonomous vehicles, drive improvements. And if you just Im implemented some of those solutions as Montreal and Vancouver are thinking through their smart city applications and solutions, their solutions to reduce commute by enabling some of these technologies, a 10% reduction in commute time, on average of 170, 227 hours on an average consumer spending time, less time on the road improves both productivity and as Rob pointed out, you know, it's great for the environment. So you start to see the numbers here, 535 million savings in, a certain, in, in Montreal, 270 million in Vancouver. Those numbers start to add up pretty significantly for communities. You think about precision agriculture and here, um, we took a, a deep study around, you know, one of the major crops that Canada exports is canola. canola. For a province like Saskatchewan, what are the benefits of leveraging IoT, leveraging autonomous drones to do high video resolution scanning of the field, collecting real-time data to improve utilization of pesticide? And reducing that pesticide usage not only drives a savings for each of the farmers, but in general, it's a significant improvement to the environment. And you'll start to see for individual farmers, it's to the rate of 40,000, and a total savings um, in Saskatchewan that's pretty incredible. The next use case that uh, you know, we looked at was energy management. There are a significant number of cities looking at how connectivity in 5G can enable smart cities. And within smart cities, we looked at two areas. One was densification of smart grid uh, for the utility industry. And the other one was just smart lighting, enabling and replacing the lighting that's in um, the communities today, getting them connected and getting them so that we can start to collect real-time data drives significant savings in communities around energy management. The last use case that we wanted to kind of highlight was rural connectivity. And here, as we think about the economic benefits that net new technologies drives, enabling broadband connectivity and improving the penetration is a significant factor in, in enabling that GDP growth and the jobs data that we talked about. In the previous report, we talked about 250,000 uh, jobs being created. That's on a spectrum of the initial deployment of the network, driving certain amounts of temporary labor for construction, for deploying the network. But the long-term benefits comes by increasing the penetration. So today, uh, broadband penetration in Canada is I think around the 86% or, uh, in Canada. The goal is to get it get to into the high 90s by 2026 and 100% by, I think, is uh, 2030. We start to kind of move the needle on connecting not only the, the urban but the rural communities. You start to see the economic benefits. So the numbers we present in this report are primarily driven from the driver being improving broadband connectivity. But then you add up all of the other benefits that we're talking about as it relates to smart lighting and energy, or as we talk about agriculture benefits, as we talk about the, um, the energy utilization, all of those in the rural communities are also a huge impact. So from a 5G perspective, you know, we see tremendous amount of benefits for rolling the network out. As we said, this is a seven year journey of deploying the network. Immediate benefits are gonna be around some of these solutions that we just talked about for the next two to three years. But 
you can start to see across Canada as 5G gets deployed, one of the things you'll start to see is it isn't going to be a national deployment, and we're not going to deploy 5G everywhere. And certain parts of these solutions only make sense in certain parts of the country. But you start to lay out the foundation of some of these types of use cases and some of these solutions in certain parts of the country, what would, could be the economic benefits in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, uh, Alberta, and, and BC as it relates to some of these use cases, it starts to provide the energy that we need to start to communicate to regulatory, uh, governments, technology providers, and the ecosystem partners of why they should be investing in the technology. Lastly, the path to the future. I mean, what is it going to take in terms of getting 5G deployed? And then what is it going to take to kind of get these benefits into the communities, into the consumers, and into the, into the industries? Partly, we talked a lot about today, innovation. And I was really impressed to see a lot of the centers of excellence, both Ontario and Canada, is driving around investments in AI, uh, investments in quantum computing. I mean, all of those are enablers for getting to kind of the innovation platform that 5G offers. Number two is the um, investment and encouraging the investments in doing these kind of smart city challenges or investing in kind of the infrastructure and, and the public and private partnerships. And lastly, just getting the ecosystem enabled, right? And making and driving and utilizing some of this technology to drive the future uh, set of applications. So in closing, we do have the report printed out. It's outside. There's a lot more detail in terms of what we see as kind of benefits for 5G, why we're driving kind of acceleration of the 5G deployment, taking some of the lessons learned from countries that are already driving the deployment in the US and in Asia PAC, and bringing those kind of lessons learned and what makes 5G successful to Canada as it starts thinking about 2020 with new spectrum auctions coming and really scaling the deployment of the technology over the coming years. Thank you. Great, I hope we're, we're mic'd up. So we're open now to uh, take questions. We've got about 20 minutes here to uh, uh, answer questions that uh, people may have. But I'll, I'll just start off by saying a little, following a little bit up. These are just some of the areas we looked at. You know, if you look at um, healthcare, um, there is an area where 5G is going to make um, a major difference uh, in terms of smart ambulances, smart hospitals, um, especially helping out uh, rural communities. As you know, it's difficult to get uh, certain surgeons, physicians into rural communities where you're going to have remote surgeries that could be happening, follow-ups that take place um, in your home with a doctor uh, being able to uh, talk to you and monitor things simultaneously. So the benefits of 5G are really going to be un un unimaginable. And I say unimaginable because I say this, when you think of when we had 3G uh, and we were on our way to 4G, um, who imagined in the world, well, if you would have imagined it, you'd be a, a billionaire today, that um, you know, you'd be able to just order a car on your phone or do all these different things in your phone today uh, that you couldn't do uh, with 3G. Um, and I talk to a lot of people and I say, well, give me some concrete examples on what 5G will actually deliver. And they say, you want to know what? It's probably just a couple of kids sitting in their parents' basement or in their garage uh, that's going to invent the next greatest thing uh, in the world uh, once 5G comes along. So it's, it's impossible to say what the next best thing will be, uh, but it's important to point out the benefits that can exist uh, from uh, society. And as Tay just pointed out, we also get asked all the time, um, so when is it going to be ready? Um, when are we going to have 5G? Um, and if you go down to the United States today, you'll hear some of their big um, uh, telecom companies saying, we've got 5G. 5G's here. 
the parameters for 5G aren't even totally established yet. Um, but the US mentality is they always want to be the first to everything. Um, so they are uh, uh, claiming uh, that they're first there. But who's in the lead in the world today? You've probably got the US who's doing quite well, China, South Korea, Japan, uh, some of these uh, other countries around the world. Is Canada in the top echelon? Probably not, but we're close behind. Um, and I always say that the U.S. beat us uh, to 4G uh, and got there before we did. Uh, but as usual, Canadians kind of catch up and then we surpass people. And, and I think that with the right government policies uh, around spectrum, uh, with the encouragement of build-outs across Canada, uh, there's no reason why uh, uh, Canada cannot be uh, a leader and a 5G superpower in a number of years. When is that going to happen? You know, we have between 2021 and 2027, I think, for that 26 billion. Um, I would say 5G will evolve over the next five to 10 years, uh, but you're not going to wake up in 2021 uh, and turn on your phone and think that you have 5G right off the bat. It's going to be uh, an evolution. You give a former politician a chance to ramble, and I will. Um, <laughs> are, are, any questions from the audience? Is there a mic? Yeah, thank you very much for this. Um, I'm Robert Fitz from Expo, and we provide deployment tools to Bell, Telus, Rogers, Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei. So I'm, that's kind of a disclosure up front. <clears throat> uh, what I want to ask uh, probably to you, Robert, would be in regards to what I've heard lately. If I look at the value that the cell phone provides, even today, let alone 5G, I think that this is my travel agent, this is my video rental store, this is my bookstore, this is Google that answers any question that I ever have, this is my research on other companies, this is my way of connecting with business cards to half the people in this room, um, and so on and so forth. The value this thing provides is way more efficient. I also look at the uh, ecological factors here. This prevents me from having to drive to a video store and back, drive to a bookstore and back, drive to a travel agent or have them deliver a ticket to me on paper, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We don't print books anymore. We will read them on these things. So it's a tremendous value. And if I look at the price that I pay, and I'm old enough to know when all these things didn't exist, what I paid on all of those items, now I see that all three, uh, all three parties, or four parties, or five parties, as, as many as you want to look in the last election here in Canada, we're talking about attacking the price of what we pay for a wireless service. My argument is this is much more efficient and cheaper than it was a few years ago. So why are they drilling in on this? And, and perhaps maybe it's a question, does your organization, or are you aware of organizations that are looking at that? What I would hate to see is that the Bell, Rogers, Telus, Videotron, and so on are impaired in their abilities to invest and branch this out further and keep us as a superpower in 4G and hopefully 5G, as you mentioned, by limiting the amount of money that these companies get to invest. And let's keep in mind that Canada is 7,500 kilometers wide, and I don't even know how tall it is, but it's big. And do we really want to compare ourselves to the Netherlands? So that's my question. Well, for any of my uh, members, uh, which are my bosses, if they're in the crowd, I did not pay this person to ask that question. Um, but that is a spectacular question um, with a lot of great points. Um, I'll, I'll dive into it like this. Uh, I've run in politics before, um, and sometimes during an election campaign, um, political parties, all of them, uh, will make promises that are low-hanging fruit, um, that attack an industry because they think that people d dislike that industry, um, and they don't do it for the betterment uh, of society, or they don't do it based on facts and evidence-based research. Uh, so I would say that the promises that you saw made during the election were political in nature. Now it's going to be my job. Uh, to get in and present the facts. Uh, and the facts are that I, I like to talk about three values. And you mentioned my, my last value, so I appreciate that, um, or my last point. But that's going to be we need quality, coverage, and value within our telecom sector and our wireless networks. 
Uh, and if you look at where we're priced today, um, and this is, there's been stats that have come out over the last number of years that between 2016 and 18, and this is the CRTC, so our regulator, an independent body, somebody who we don't necessarily always agree with, has come out and said between 2016 and 18, wireless prices in Canada per gigabyte of data have declined by 30, up to 35%, on average 27, 28. You've had StatsCan that has, has it even higher in some measurements between 2015 and 18, uh, up to 50%. That doesn't even factor in all of the um, uh, unlimited plans uh, that you've seen introduced just over the last year. Um, so I think that it's up to us to do a better job in terms of pointing out to Canadians the value, which is your, your avenue that you've mentioned. But I also talk value, and if you notice in my remarks today, when I read Tage's report, or the draft a few weeks ago, everywhere that I read through the report, I said there's an environmental value to this as well. Um, so all those values will equate uh, to Canadians getting good value. So we need to make sure that uh, we support facilities-based carriers. Right now, uh, there's a debate going on on whether or not to allow MVNOs to have mandated access. MVNOs exist in Canada today, but they negotiate with the carriers on a price. Uh, anywhere in the world where you've seen mandated MVNOs, um, you have not seen lower prices, and you've seen a lot less in terms of investments. Um, and I think it would be a detrimental decision if we see mandated MVNOs introduced in Canada in terms of connecting those, if I say 99% of Canadians have access to LTE networks uh, where they live, that means there's still 350,000 people in Canada without. If we want to connect those 350,000 people, if we want to make sure we have 5G there, encouraging facilities-based competition is important. And Quite frankly, facilities-based competition within our country is still in the growing stages. And I say growing stages because, just so everybody knows, not everybody might not, might not know what facilities-based competition is. Facilities-based means those carriers out there that build their own networks to be able to deliver the services that you have. So in Canada, we have the incumbents. So you've got TELUS, Rogers, Bell, and you've got the new entrants. And the new entrants are Shaw, Videotron, uh, ExploreNet, Eastlink, hope I'm not forgetting any, um, uh, that are creating that new competition within Canada. And people say, well, we need more competition, you need more players. Just in the US that has 350 million people, 10 times our size, they can't survive off four major carriers. Two of them are just merging right now uh, because it's a very capital intensive business to be building wireless networks. Um, so I love all your points. Um, I think you're right. Uh, it's going to be my job now and the carriers in Canada uh, to be presenting to government and the CRTC the facts and evidence-based research uh, around why we need to ensure that facilities-based competition continues and that it has the opportunity to continue and grow. So uh, I have a question about uh, the fact that 5G is a local access technology and that uh, a lot of the communities like in the north, their problem is the backhaul. So it's fine to give everybody one gig to their cell phone, but if it's a, a satellite link to the rest of the world, how does that solve the problem? And not only from that perspective, but a lot of the infrastructure, for example, the internet, interconnection between the major uh, ISPs is done in the US and not in Canada. So even when you get onto the highway, the highway is taking this detour and we're so dependent on the US instead of having a Canadian internet. And not only that, our connection to the rest of the world is through the US and not having our own pathways. So whose responsibility is it to improve the highway once you get on it? Um. So I'll take the, the first part of it, which is more the, the technology piece, um, and then we'll kind of talk about um, the, the second point of the conversation. The rural connectivity, and we, we in our study, showed um, that leveraging wireless technology 
even on the um, even for rural communities is cheaper than running fiber uh, all the way out there to your point there's still work to be done in wireless to extend the the spectrum as well as the, the connectivity to get to some of those remote sites and over time as you think about these facility-based carriers when they migrate from 3g and 4g technology it's um, incumbent upon them to kind of standardize on that technology so that they can standardize their operations and leverage kind of the operational efficiencies that come from 5G. So backhaul is still uh, a significant portion of building out a network and that isn't going to change. I mean, when we think about 5G deployments in the U.S. and other places, there are still significant investments being done to get fiber out to the, to, to the points. Where I start to see... Um, uh, Collaboration is also in the virtualization space. So when you think about um, this kind of cloud native architecture and virtualization, there's opportunities to leverage the cloud providers and kind of the backhaul networks that they provide. Now, there are certain portions of the country where it's just very remote that we're gonna have to figure out how do we do multi-access kind of connectivity to really get more speeds out there. But in general, the evolution of this architecture into 5G is going to drive the cost down and is going to improve the, con the overall speeds. But the highway to the U.S. or to highway to Internet, you might want to ask that question again. I'm not sure I understood exactly what you were saying on that. What I was saying is that the certain providers today, their interconnectedy uh, Internet is in the U.S., so that means if I'm going between Rogers and Bell, my traffic is actually going through the U.S. And, you know, there, that raises all kinds of questions about performance, uh, data sovereignty, and all that. There's no edict from the governments or industry to say you should provide your interconnect to the Internet in Canada, number one. And number two, there's no direct link from Canada to anywhere else. Everything goes through the U.S. So who's solving those problems? I, I, honestly, I, you'd have to talk to individual carriers in terms of how uh, the backhaul works and where it goes. I'm not an expert uh, in that area, but I'll uh, be happy to meet with you after and work on getting you that information. Thanks. I think I have somebody over here. Yes. Uh, good, good morning or good afternoon. I guess we're still good morning. Anyway, hi. Yeah, I'm Craig. Um, I guess I was curious. Um, I was going to initially ask just about 5G, but... Since you bring up facilities-based competition, uh, and one of the biggest issues we have in Canada has to do with the huge scope geographically that we have. Um, facilities-based competition, if you were to go back, obviously, to the road environment, would say that if Ford wants to uh, build a highway to put Ford cars on, they would have to build a highway. Um, Volvo would have to build a highway. With the networks we have today, we only need one highway. So the fact that we're trying to build five independent facilities-based uh, highways um, significantly is an over, uh, we're, we're duplicating the capital expenditure by three or four times, um, which significantly limits the extent that we can cover our various rural areas. Um, and part of the issues with facilities-based competition is we're vertically integrated. Um, so I guess I'd be curious as to the comments, um, given the capacity of 5G, um, if we were to separate the services from the network and only build one very capable network but do it on a commodity basis, which is not our current incumbent model, uh, we could then have true competition on the services scale, which is where more of the innovation uh, takes place. Um, and I don't see much of that in Canada, although it's worked out very well in many other parts of the world. Um, in New Zealand, for instance, by law, you have to separate the facilities from the services um, so that you get that innovation and you get better coverage and better network capability out there. Uh, so I'd be curious as to your comments on that. Um, and secondly, uh, moving to the, the second gentleman, Tejas, um, you have a lot of advantages there in terms of your money. I guess I'd be curious as to know, um, uh, it seems to me there's a bit of confusion between what broadband will give you in the rural areas, as well as what the incremental part that 5G will get you. Because you have a conflict, right? To get the capacity of 5G, you go way up in frequency. In rural areas, that doesn't buy you much because you basically require optical line of sight, which in a lot of areas of Canada, particularly I'm from Alberta, northern Alberta and BC, um, <laughs> that is very hard to come by. So if I just leave it at the two questions, I'd appreciate your comments. Thank you. Great. Okay. I'll, you go first, and okay. I'll follow up. Um, so the second part of your, your question just around, uh, was it around technology and just uh, 5G in general for rural? 
Is that? Could you read that last part again for me? What was the second part? Because I, I, I'll touch on the, the network sharing piece for a second, and then you can add to it, and then okay. I'll come back to, to your question. Um, I would say that you're right on, on when we start to look at the economics of 5G deployment and looking at the cost of backhaul and kind of looking at the small cell densification and what it's going to take to actually densify this network. Um, the economics for us to get to the true 5G use cases does need to change from a deployment perspective because, you know, when there was only macro towers and less small cell deployment, um, the cost equation of multi-tenant data on the, on the macro towers was helping kind of deploy those, those types of networks. But as you want to get to the edge cases of 5G and innovation of moving edge compute to the, uh, to the, to the radio network, creating these small cell uh, densifications at millimeter waves, you start to see that you need to get the cost equation down by, by at least two-thirds. And the only way we think we can, you can get there is through collaboration and, and partnership and sharing on either the back hall or the front hall. We see a significant savings if we start to model out what the true network deployment costs when you start to collaborate and share on, on both uh, network deployment and small cells as well as the front and back hall. We don't see that in the US as much, but we do see it working well in Europe. And I would say in Canada, I mean, when you look at the 4G networks with Bell and TELUS, they've kind of started down that path of at least sharing on the radio network. So that model has been at least implemented in Canada more so than I see in the US, which I think as you think about the investments they need to make, um, you'll start to see some level of collaboration to really get to that densification, which is hard to do unless you get uh, permitting access and, and access to a lot more poles to really enable the 5G use cases. So that's on kind of the, the network sharing and, and how to kind of get these deployments done faster. One, it increases the, the deployment speed, but also it makes the whole business case and ROI a lot better. Yeah, I so saw obviously I'm for um, facilities-based competition, but I think when you look at our country, there are some remote areas out there where uh, the economics uh, don't necessarily make sense to connect uh, Canadians on a business case scenario in terms of getting your return on capital. That's why uh, it's important for us to have uh, governments uh, be involved in ensuring all Canadians get protected or, or connected. Now, if I could go back, I, I, part of my issue is today with broadband funds and CRTC funds and provincial funds is it's a bit haphazard. Um, and I'd like to see whoever the new minister of ISED is to get together with all those other groups to ensure that when we do these build outs, uh, to connect Canadians, that we do it in the best possible and efficient manner because, as we saw from the economics of it, the more you can connect individuals that aren't connected today, the more economic uh, advantages there are going to be in place. And then, you know, just on, on your second part of the question, which was really more, I think, millimeter wave, line of sight um, types of applications and how does that really play out in, in rural, I think was the, uh, the question, right? Um, you know, one of our partnerships that we work with uh, in terms of kind of evolution, we're going to start to see improvements in kind of wireless technology and how far they can actually transmit the, uh, the signals. So what there's testing today, which is to get to the gigabit, requires millimeter wave, requires um, uh, kind of short distances, but you can start, still deploy 5G in kind of the mid-band spectrum. You're not going to get to the one gigabit speed, but you'll still get improved connectivity, improved speeds. And as we're doing kind of field trials and field testing, we're starting to see all of the chipset manufacturers, all of the network equipment providers continuously improving on, with their R&D on how they can get these signals, one, through buildings and through uh, material, but also just trying to get the distance. I'm sure we could ask lots more questions, but uh, we're starting to run out of time. Robert and Tejas, I want to thank you so much for this, uh, not just the presentation, it was uh, so infor informative, but the, for the significant and important work that you're doing for uh, connections and connectivity in Canada. So thank you very much. Thank you.